John, you were a folk uh, music guy in your younger days. I, I still sing Celtic folk songs. Yeah. Could you sing one now for us? Come on, ye loyal heroes. Nice. And listen while I sing. Don't tire with any master. I need some ale to Till you see what your work will bring. But you must rise up early from the clear daylight of dawn. You never will be able to plow the rocks of Bonn. That was lovely. Very well done, yes. <laughs> that was very nice. Ben Salango, what did you think about that right there from Mr. Doyle? I give that a 10 out of 10. I think, I think you have Amer the American Idol on your show. <laughs> 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 no. That was very good. That was, good. that I, was you nice. Know what? Forget my interview. Let's just just keep singing. I'm going to pour a pint. Yeah. <laughs> I needed a Guinness. <laughs> I needed me a stout while that was going on. Ben Salengo, good morning to you, sir. How are you feeling? I am doing well. Thanks for having me on. Great to have you with us. You, uh, as I understand it, have made a decision to not be a part of the race for the Democratic primary uh, governorship there, sir. I, I did. It was a. Uh, it took me a while to get there. Honestly, it was a very difficult decision. Um, you know, the, when I ran in 2020, it didn't work out, obviously. And uh, but I had a blast. I mean, I enjoyed the campaigning. I enjoyed traveling the state. I I really enjoyed having the uh, debates, both in the primary and the general. Uh, but ultimately, you know, it was it was just not the right time for me. Uh, it, it, I think it's going to be difficult for. A Democrat to win statewide. I mean, let's just kind of state the obvious. Uh, it would be an incredibly expensive campaign. I would have to put in a lot of my own money, uh, like I did back in uh, 2020. And ultimately, you know, you're you're trying for a long shot. And I just wasn't willing to give up the next year of my life on the road, missing soccer matches and family time, and spending a ton of money uh, when most likely I wouldn't be able to win. Was there an agreement between you and Steve Williams that only one of you would run in the primary? No, no. There, you know, he and I had talked. We've met a few times. And uh, obviously I didn't want to run against Steve. Steve's a friend of mine. I, there are several friends of mine that are running for on the Republican side for governor. Uh, so you don't want to run against your friends. But, you know, there wasn't necessarily a, a, any type of agreement, but, he didn't want to run against me. I didn't want to run against him. But ultimately, it was just a decision that I made based upon timing. You know, I you know I run a law firm. Um, I'm a county commissioner in Kanawha, which keeps me very busy. The firm keeps me very busy. I have other businesses that I run, and so the timing just wasn't right. And and ultimately, what it was going to come down to is, I think, for a Democrat to win statewide not just the governor's race, but in particular the governor's race, you would have to have something like happened back in 1992 where, you know, West Virginia was a very blue state. Uh, you had Manchin and Charlotte Pritt squaring off in the Democratic primary. Uh, Charlotte Pritt ultimately won that. But then the Manchin supporters didn't follow her over and actually voted for Cecil Underwood, which is how you, you got a Republican governor in a very Democratic state back in 92. So you, would, you need some type of phenomenon like that. If the if the Republican primary is going to be as brutal as I anticipate it will be, you know, you need some of those supporters from the candidate that lost to turn and vote blue, which would would be difficult. I think it's more difficult in that situation for that to happen than it would be for Democrats back in 92 to vote for a Republican. John Doyle, you were around in 92. I was, and I remember that very much. Uh, the uh, 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 I, I, I sort of disagree with you in, in one sense, Ben. Well, maybe not because we haven't gotten to it yet. I think another factor is had you and Steve Williams run against each other, you would have been forced to spend money that whoever the winner was would not have to spend in the general election. Uh, that, that's true. Yeah. yeah and, there's definitely an, el an element to that. So keep in mind, too, you know, one of the things that, that running in, in 2000 did was it – increase my name identification statewide which john you know is is very important when you're running a statewide race or even even a local race i mean if you don't have name id you you have to basically run a bunch of ads i mean there are candidates that have been on the ballot so many times where they have just this inherent name identification 
and they don't have to spend as much money. You know, Jim Justice at 97, 98% statewide name ID, uh, if he just had a regular race, U.S. Senate may be a little different, but if just a regular race, he wouldn't have to spend as much money because everybody knows him. Well, Patrick Morrissey, some of the others that have been around a while. Um, now, my name ID is not up there with theirs, but I'm in the 75 to 80% statewide. Uh, Steve is a little bit lower. So Steve's going to have to spend a lot of money to get his name ID up there. That's right. And and because you're not going to be there and and I'm guessing he's going to run. I mean all all of the uh, all of the vibes that are that are emanating from from Huntington uh, indicate to us that Steve will run. Uh, uh because he does not have to uh spend money to beat you. He he can kind of hold that money back and use it for November and I do believe that the uh the Republican primary is going to be is going to be nasty enough that uh, that that a Demo- that, that that a Democrat who hasn't had a primary will have a, a, a chance to win the race. But that's uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, I do. Yeah, and and we studied all those possibilities. I looked at every bit of it, and, and quite frankly, when you're looking at, I, I think the general election. It's probably. I think the primary is going to be. I think the Republican each candidate is probably going to spend, spend between three to five million dollars to have a legitimate chance of, of winning that primary. And, and I'm just talking about hard money. I'm not talking about soft money coming in from uh, like independent expenditures. Uh, then, if you focus on the general, I think the Democratic candidate's going to need around two to three million dollars uh, for advertising time. Maybe a little bit higher if you're looking at if you have state. You know, if your name ID is a little bit lower, but uh, I simply wasn't willing to put that kind of money in yeah. to try to thread that needle. Right, I understand. Uh, incidentally, and with what you just said about the Republican primary, if you need two to three million dollars to win that Republican primary, at the moment it looks like there's a couple of people in there that probably ought to drop out, <laughs> given the fundraising yeah. total so far, and probably will. Hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd said on, on this was months ago that back when uh, Moore Capito was polling a lot lower than he is now, uh, to not count out Moore Capito because, first of all, his grandfather was governor, uh, his mom is a United States senator. They have the political infrastructure statewide. Uh, it, it is not a situation where Moore Capito is running without name ID or without this infrastructure. You know, if uh, if calls are made from the Capito family to raise money, people will give them money. Absolutely. I suspect, <laughs> that, I suspect that you're going to see um, a political machine that is decades in the making uh, starting to work very soon. And Patrick Morrissey is going to have all that money from Club for Growth. Yes. So he's in yep. really good shape. Chris Miller's in good shape if he wants to spend his own money. And that, that, of course, is up to him. But I think, I think the others in the race, uh, I don't know where they get their money. Well, you know, I think that the reason why they came, the Republican candidates came out so early is because they were all fishing in that same pond. I and mean, they were all trying to get that money, the, the local dollars, to the extent that there's enough local dollars to win a statewide race. A lot of times you have to go out of state. But I think they were coming out early to try to get those commitments. And, you know, I've looked at all their financial reports, and you can see, I mean, some people are vote, are donating to multiple campaigns, which is, <laughs> is very painful, by the way, if, if you're doing that. I mean, you're giving, you know, money to each of the campaigns. Um, so they came out early to try to get those dollars, and the ones who were successful are getting ahead. Now, Chris Miller, I think, has given himself about $2.9 million in loans. Um and he's, he's a very wealthy businessman. He's uh, well-respected down here. Chris is a friend of mine. Uh, Chris does a lot for the community, both in uh, Huntington and also in Charleston. He does a lot. So he's got, you know, he's got a lot of support down here. The polling doesn't necessarily reflect that of late, but, you know, he's polling higher, quite frankly, than uh, some others that have won statewide races. And for the benefit of our of the of, of our listeners up here, uh, who don't know who Chris Miller is, he's the he is the son of Congresswoman Carol Miller, and he's also the owner of uh, what's called the Miller Auto Group. It's a string of uh, auto dealerships in in the southern part of the state. A lot of people up here don't know that. So, 
It's a it's a very successful automobile dealership in the southern part, and he is on TV all the time and has been for years. Uh, I think it may have been started by his grandfather, but he's basically the face of the company and, and runs the company now. And, and, Ben, I believe that some of those ads he runs – are not good for him when it comes to running for office. I don't know. Not many people up here have seen those ads, but some of them are. I just kind of shake my head. We've we've had them on the show a couple times. They're they're entertaining. They yes. are entertaining for sure. I think if people understand that that's what the ads are about, they're more entertainment. Uh, then I don't think it'll hurt him too much, right. quite frankly. But they they are funny. I mean, if, they're probably on YouTube. You need to pull up and watch them if you haven't. Car dealer ads are not real life, right? <laughs> <laughs> they, they can be very creative, though. Yes. <laughs> they definitely are. And his, his are in particular. I mean, they're funny. Ben, this is Matt Miller. I wanted to ask, you mentioned that now is not the time, and part of that reasoning for you is that it's a real uphill climb right now for the Democrat with the way that the state is. What's it going to take for the Democrat Party to be able to kind of turn that table? While it may not be this upcoming election, you know, looking ahead even to the next election. I think the Democratic Party has to develop a, a deep bench, starting with local with local elections. And, and you see that in, in a lot of the cities. I mean, you've got Democrats that are winning at mayor and county commission and city council and, you know, the local elections. And then generating an enough trust where the Democrat can then go on to, to win statewide. I mean, you know, if you look at Steve Williams, he's very popular in Huntington. Uh, he has been around for a long time. He's, you know, he was in the House of Delegates for a while. And, I, you know, Steve's got a lot of trust. He's got a lot of friends. Now, he's going to have to distance himself from the National Party because if, if you poll that in West Virginia, uh, and particularly when, you know, if you look at my race in, in particular after 2020, uh, voters didn't dislike me. They disliked the National Party. And so it was it was tough to kind of walk that line to where you are saying, look, I'm a moderate Democrat. I'm more like, you know, 70 percent of West Virginians. I'm not on the far right fringe. I'm not on the far left fringe. I'm just kind of in the middle like most people are. And, um, you know, getting that message out is is number one, it's difficult because then you've got outside interests pounding every single day that the idea that any Democrat must be associated with the far left of the Democratic Party. Um, and you've got to have a lot of money to be, to counter that message. So that's what it's going to take. It's going to take time. It's going to take money. And it's going to take trust. Yeah. How do you go about separating yourself from the National Party? In, in, a, in a state like you talked about, where Democrat does not mean the same thing as it means on the national level. Well, you switch to the Republican it, Party has been the main strategy of the right. Democrats around the <laughs> yeah. state. Well, it, and I, you know, it's um, my wife and I, during the 2020 election, we were driving from uh, Charleston down to Beckley. I went to see my mom, and there was a, there was just somebody's, in somebody's yard, like along the interstate, there was a big picture of me and a big picture of Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> and, and, and they had done this themselves. I mean, I give them a lot of credit. It, they had spent money and done this themselves. And it basically says, Salango is just another national Democrat. And so when you've got that deep ingrained dislike of the national Democratic Party in West Virginia, it is tough. It is very tough. In fact, I should have stopped by that house just to say, hey, you know, <laughs> I, don't even, I don't know Nancy Pelosi. I've never met her. Um, <laughs> but that, that's the, you know, that's the game they use. That's the spin that they use, and it's been very successful. You know, the Republicans have out-messaged the Democrats for years, and this is what you get. I'm going to uh, – uh, Ben, this is John again. Uh, if Steve gets in the race, I'm going to encourage him to have a conversation – with someone named uh, Marie Glusenkamp Perez, who represents a congressional district in the state of Washington that is about as red as either of the two districts in West Virginia. She's a Democrat. She won last time, beat an incumbent Republican. Uh, and I think she has come up with the boilerplate for how a Democrat wins in a red area. 
Mm-hmm. So uh, if he decides to run, I'm going to suggest that he just, you know, ask to sit down and talk with her and say, listen, tell me how you did it. Uh, it's uh, uh, another thing w- about uh, three years ago, 2020, in your case, you were running against a, a very popular incumbent. Now, in the beginning, yeah. he was not very popular. When you got in the race, he was one of the most unpopular governors in the country. But along came COVID, and he handled COVID, I thought, exactly right. The, the, the voters gave him credit for him, for it. And so at the time of the election, uh, he, was, he was pretty much impossible for anybody to beat. I, I agree. I, I think people rally around their leader in times of crisis. You see that you know, time and time again, both nationally and locally. But um, I agree with that 100%. You know, when we polled it back in 2019, before I decided to get in, if you put Jim Justice against a generic Democrat, just anybody, it was a six-point differential. Um, then COVID happened. I was in the race, and people rallied around him. And, and yeah. you know, I have been very candid to say I thought he did a really good job. Uh, it was tough to distinguish what he was doing from what I would do. Of course, there are always some things that you can point out. But overall, people thought and think he's very sincere. He's doing what's best for the state. And um, he was distinguishing himself from the Republicans on the far right. You know, he was out there saying, this is what is in your best interest, even when some were saying otherwise, you know, he, so I thought he did, I thought he did a very good job. He's done a, he's did a, he's done a good job as a governor. No, I disagree with that. I do think he did an excellent job with COVID, but overall as a governor, I don't think he has, uh, uh, because he's not, uh, he, he, he has not been open to the public with a whole lot of things. Uh, he, he financial doesn't financial dealings, it, 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 huh? <laughs> financial dealings. Uh, I yeah, wasn't even you know getting what? into he that. I'm talking would. about the job as governor. He has these press conferences anymore where he really will not allow follow up questions on anything. Uh, he has, he, he's Jerry rigged the state budget to the point where, uh, he has really abused the authority that were that was given to governors many years ago in the modern budget amendment. And I think the time has now come to give the legislature an official voice in in how to set budgets. We're one of only eight states where the legislature has to take the governor's word on 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 what the state's finances are, no matter what, even if they're convinced that th- that there's something wrong with the with the arithmetic. Uh, but, so, but the counter, but the counter to that, John, is if you, keep in mind the people know about his financial problems. You know, look in in the primary in the Republican primary, um, that was a big issue. There were mil- millions and millions of dollars spent in the Republican primary in 2020 talking about Jim Justice financial problems. People didn't yeah. care. I mean, it was it was an overwhelming victory. I spent a lot of money. Reminding people about his financial problems in 2020 in the general, people didn't care. In 2016, a lot of money was spent telling people about his financial problems. They don't care. Um, And people know that he's not taking questions from the press. But that, again, is about messaging because the Republicans have done a a, a good job saying, well, fake news. Uh, You can't trust the media. Now, I disagree with that message. I think it's terrible. But people are buying it. And so if you're talking about him being, uh, uh, you know, not a good governor because of those things, maybe certain people think that. But I tell you what, the overwhelming majority of people don't think that. Yeah, Ben, I, I didn't bring up his personal finances. That was Rob. Uh, but what <laughs> I brought up was you, you threw me under the bus when it suited I, your you're argument, right. didn't you? You're darn right, I did. <laughs> uh, the, no, the the finance the, the finance financial problem I brought up is the way he has monkeyed with the budget. Now, it's true the state law permits him to do that, and I thought years ago it shouldn't, but he is the first governor we have had, uh, really since Arch Moore, that has abused that prerogative of, uh, of, of basically saying the, bu- the, the, the budget is what I say it is. Uh, the, 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 the estimates are what I say they are. So anyway, Hey Ben, we are just about out of time. I want to thank you for yours and I appreciate you being on the program here today.